Uh, now I invite here Professor Filippo Mengsor, who is a professor in informatics and computer science at Indiana University and the director of the Center for Complex Network and Systems. And you will try and risk to use the iPad. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. Again, like everybody else, I'm very honored uh, to have been named a fellow of the ISI. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the work that we're doing in collaboration with, uh, with people at the ISI on attention dynamics. And this is... Uh, a follow-up a little bit on what uh, Yamir started talking about earlier, where we're doing computational social science. We're trying to understand the behaviors of, of social systems. So let me start uh, by showing you a picture of Marvin the Martian. Um, so this picture was posted on Facebook um, when we were beginning to get pictures uh, from uh, the, the, the Mars rover. <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, the timing and the humor was just perfect that it went viral. And um, here's a picture of what happened on Facebook. People started resharing it and resharing it and resharing it. And so we have a beautiful illustration of what happens when things go viral on social networks. Um, these memes, in this case this photo, uh, travel from community to, co to community, from person to person, and they can go very far. So we have these huge cascades. Other people have talked about cascades. And, and as Yamir pointed out, we have a few very successful cascades like this of things that go viral, and we all pay attention to them. And the more uh, they're successful and popular, and the more people pay attention. And then, of course, there are most other things, like the things that I post on Facebook that nobody cares about. <laughs> so how did that happen? So we are interested in studying these dynamics of, of attention and of popularity. And we actually started doing this um, in a different context, it was uh, looking at the spread of misinformation instead of memes in general. So for example, in the context of politics, of US politics, we observed that people were cheating and creating the appearance that some candidate was very popular. And in fact, this was all fake, created by fake accounts and so on. So during the last elections, this was a cover of a magazine that mentioned our project through the, of looking at um, as how harmful this misinformation could be. But I want to tell you a little bit about different aspects of, of, uh, of attention in different contexts. And uh, one of them is uh, the interaction between uh, how information spreads on our social network and how uh, the network itself evolves and changes. This feedback loop between the dynamics of, um, uh, the, dynamics of the network and the dynamics on the network. And, Second, um, I'll say a little bit about uh, work on competition for attention because, of course, um, all this information is competing for our attention and how does that affect what becomes uh, popular and what doesn't. And then finally, community, uh, the formation of groups in these, in these groups, of, in these social networks may give us some key to interpret uh, the spread and the virality of information. So let's start with this feedback loop um, of, of uh, the, the uh, attention that spreads on the network or the memes that spread and that capture our attention and how that affects the structure of the network itself. Here at the top, you could see that, uh, imagine that this is something like Twitter or Facebook where people follow their friends and pay attention to them. And you can see that uh, the node A there is a person who's seeing stuff that is posted by B, even though A is not necessarily following B. But it, this information reaches uh, a uh, through some intermediary nodes. So at some point, A may, may decide, well, let me pay attention to B because B is, you know, Bob is posting interesting stuff, I want to follow him. Um, and so that's, that could be one mechanism of how links get created in the network and how the structure itself changes in response to the traffic that travels on the network. Of course, if we disregard traffic and just look at the structure, then we could also have this link from B to A, and this is called triadic closure, and it's been studying along. And in fact, all of you who use Twitter or Facebook, you'll notice that every day they say, well, you might be, you might be interested in this person or this person. And all that the systems is doing is just suggesting to close triangles. So the question is, 
what happens to these triangles if you actually pay attention to the traffic on the network rather than just the structure. So um, we were lucky to have access through a collaboration with colleagues at Yahoo to an, uh, a data set uh, from one such system called Yahoo Meme, um, a longitudinal data set where we had information about every single event so that when a new link is created, we could tell what has happened before, what information has, ha, um, has been seen by the node that generates this network. And it turns out that, in fact, triadic closure is a very important mechanism, very, uh, very prevalent. So a lot of the links can be attributed to triadic closure. But a sizable fraction of the links could be att attributed to these kind of traffic shortcuts, where people start paying attention to other people from whom they have seen information. You may notice the sum doesn't add up to 100, uh, and that's because uh, if you close a triangle on which there is traffic, that's also an instance of triadic closure, of course. So the two are not disjoint. Um, but you can also have longer shortcuts, right? Not just a triangle. You may have uh, you may connect to somebody who's generated some information that is more than two steps uh, removed from you. Okay, so. Um, one thing that is interesting is to, instead of looking at this at the aggregate level, to look at individual users, okay? So are there people who are specifically doing this kind of in, uh, shortcut who are making the network more efficient in terms of spreading of information, and what do they look like? So we did this with an approach called maximum likelihood estimation. I'm, I won't go into the detail, but basically you assign some parameters to, uh, based on different behaviors to the users, and then you classify the users in different groups. So for example, um, this group here, these are the people who mostly are closing triangles, okay? So without respect to, to the traffic on the network. They're just sort of um, uh, following their, the friends of their friends, okay? And up here we have a group in which instead people are mostly creating shortcuts. They're trying to be efficient. They're following people that, they're not, that they aren't following yet that from whom they see information. So what are the characteristics of these users who are making the network more, more efficient? And that is, uh, that's where we see some interesting stuff. So for example, at the top left here, you see that the information group, the users who tend to create these information shortcuts and make the network more efficient, tend to live longer. They, they are the older users, the users who've been in the system for a longer time. Um, they also follow more people, uh, and, but they, even, they have even more followers, so they're popular users. Okay, they're active and they're popular. They're, they're also influential in the sense that the stuff that they write gets reposted, gets propagated more by other people. And they're active because they post a lot, but even more than what, how, how active they are in posting original information, they repost stuff from other people. So they're the big spreaders. So, so this is interesting because it gives us a key to interpret this feedback between the stuff that propagates and how that makes the network more, more efficient in terms of creating shortcuts for information to, to travel. So that's one aspect of, of the attention. Here we're paying attention to who's posting the interesting stuff and then we are uh, focusing on them. Let me switch a little bit and um, take a digression into the consequences of the fact that we are competing for attention, okay? Uh, so the attention economy, this term, it was, uh, it's been around for a long time. It was Herb Simon who noted uh, that a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. And we are definitely in this attention economy, right? We're bombarded with stuff, so we have to decide what, who wins. What am I going to pay attention to? And uh, this is basically a, something that Yamir already showed you. If you look at popularity of, for example, size of cascade of a meme, um, you find these power laws. And you can define popularity any way you want. How many people talk about something? Uh, how many messages talk about something? How long a particular meme survives? How many, how, for how many days or weeks or months? And you find these broad distributions where there are big winners, right? The viral stuff. And that's the name of the game right now. There's huge amounts of money in figuring out how to get your message to go viral. 
But, um, and, oh, and by the way, an example of something that would be at this end would be anything concerning Justin Bieber as an example. So what we would like to ask is, what is the consequence of, of our finite attention, uh, competition for this finite attention in getting this kind of popularity dynamics? Because if you look at the system in general, and how many things happen on a system like Twitter, you have some days in which a lot of stuff is happening. You can measure this by the entropy, right? People are talking about many, many different things. And there are other days in which most people are talking about just a few things. And this, this is a huge difference. But if you look at an individual user, how many things we pay attention to, it's more or less constant on any given day, right? So this suggests this idea of competition. And the question that we asked is, could we, what are the consequences of this in finding those dynamics? So is it the case that these big winner memes are the most interesting things? Um, so to, to, to study this, we built a very simple toy model uh, that kind of mimics how Facebook or Twitter works. You log in and with some probability you post something, maybe a picture from last night, uh, or with some probability you just look at what other people post and you repost some of them that you're interested in, and you remember the things that you're interested in, so you have a memory or interests. Uh, but these things are forgotten after a while, and this is to model our finite attention, right? So um, the set of things that we look at is only so long. I mean, you're not gonna go online and look at what Dirk posted six months ago, but I might look at what he posted yesterday, right? Um, so we have a, 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 and also the things that we post, we remember, but we remember for a while. If we don't talk about something for a week or so, then maybe that's old news. And of course, um, this mechanism works on the social network itself, uh, where people follow other people and so on. So there are two key ingredients here. One is the social network, the structure of the social network. And the other one is this limited attention, right? This parameter that determines how long our memory is, how, how far in the past we remember things. And it turns out that they're both important. If you don't have the structure of the social network, if you have a random network, you don't get these broad distributions of popularity. But the finite attention is important too. If you, have, uh, if you don't have enough attention, basically if you just forget things right away, you don't get things that uh, memes that live for a very long time. On the other hand, if you have very much attention, if you remember everything and you don't have to be selective, then you don't get any meme that becomes very popular. But if you have some intermediate amount of attention, finite, not infinite, not zero, and this information spreads on the network, what you observe is that you get this popularity where there's big winners. And the interesting thing here is that, of course, all these memes are the same in this model, right? Nothing is more interesting than anything else. So when we look at the dynamic of virality, we have to keep in mind that there would be some winners anyway. It doesn't matter. So it brings us back to uh, what Duncan was talking about last night, luck, right? So that may play an important role. So when we look at pictures of kids farting in the bathtub and, or movies, and some of them get seen by hundreds of thousands of people and others only by a handful, well, it doesn't necessarily mean that one is better than the other. In fact, they may be identical, right? So um, this sounds like bad news in a sense, right? It, it means, well, how can you predict anything? How can you say anything if, if you can have these big winners just randomly? Uh, but it turns out that um, there may be some interesting cues in the structure of the network, in the community structure in particular. Um, we've looked at the formation of community, in particular from traffic, from communication between users. Um, I don't have time to go into the detail of this, but communities can emerge in many different ways, from uh, people collaborating, for example, uh, scholars work writing papers together, or uh, we've looked in the, so in the political scene, right? Uh, you may unfollow people who have different political opinions so that you get these polarized um, networks as we have observed in the US politics, the liberals on one side and the conservatives on the other, and people only retweet others who have the same ideas. So you see this big echo chamber of polarization. But the question is, does this kind of structure tell us something about what's going to be viral? And 
Um, I'll try to, I know I'm, I only have a, a minute left, so let me uh, try to quickly uh, tell you about some recent results about the spread of ideas and how it differs from the spread of diseases, for example. So um, some, uh, recently some people referred to the, to the spread of diseases as simple contagion in the sense that each contact event has some same probability of the disease being transmitted. And so the argument has been, and we've seen a number of papers recently on this, that ideas are different in the sense that you have to be exposed to the same idea multiple times, then you may adopt it, right? And so people refer to complex contagion and in, in this sense, and communities give us a key to interpret com, com, uh, complex contagion. For once, because if, if two people are in the same community and one adopts a behavior from another, then there is a lot of triangles, therefore lots of people who are going to be exposed to have multiple exposures, okay? So inside the community, you're gonna have faster spread. And the other one, of course, is that because of homophily, inside a community, it is more likely that two people have similar interests, so they may adopt the same behavior. So what we expect to observe, because of complex contagion, is that there's gonna be a lot of concentration inside communities. Right? And in fact, we do observe this. If we look at, for example, how many memes travel on edges, uh, you see, we see a lot more traffic inside a community than across community, communities, a picture like that. Whereas if we had a simple contagion, then we would observe much less concentration, right? Stuff would travel through the boundaries. So what happens in the real data? Sorry, this is slightly technical, but... Um, let me just give you the gist of it. You can actually measure concentration in communities using entropy or other measures, right? So in this plot here, on the y-axis, you have a measure of entropy so that lower means more concentrated inside communities, okay? And we have a bunch of uh, baselines, some that assume that there is this complex contagion inside a community and some that assumes that there is simple contagion. And what we observe in the real data is that for most memes, we see very high concentration, even higher than the models of complex contagion. That's the black line there, right? High contagion. But for a few memes that happen to be the viral ones, those stuff that really spreads like fire, in fact, the concentration is very low. It is as low as models with simple contagion. So what this is telling us, or hinting, is that viral stuff spreads more like diseases, okay? Like simple contagion. So this suggests that we could use the structure of the network to predict what's gonna go viral, okay? So if we see early on, let's say look at the first 30 tweets or the first 50 tweets. If you see that these tweets are already crossing boundaries and not there is a community and covering different communities, you might predict that they're gonna become very popular. If you see that stuff is pretty much con concentrated, even though the number of tweets is the same, you might predict that stuff doesn't necessarily go viral. Your friends, your family might retweet it, but it's not gonna go out there in the wide world. So, based on this idea, this is my last slide, you can uh, use a machine learning approach and devise some features to capture this concentration and see if you can make some prediction. So, F is a measure of, um, of how well you can predict what is going to go viral. It's something that balances precision and recall so that you don't have so many false positives, false negatives. And imagine a baseline in which you predict that stuff is not gonna go viral. You're actually gonna do very well that way because most things do not go viral. Okay, so um, with features, predictive features that look at um, how popular stuff is, how many early adopters there are, and how big is the frontier, for example, how influential the early adopters are, you can improve your prediction accuracy by about 3% over the baseline. But if you use community-based features, such as this entropy that I showed you earlier, or uh, concentration measures, then you can improve uh, this F measure, this quality measure, a lot more, right? 170%, it's almost uh, scary. So this tells us that the structure of the network gives us an important key to predict what's going to go viral by just simply assuming that the viral things don't, are not so limited by, by boundaries of our communities. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. And uh, I don't have time to mention them, but there are list pictures of the many collaborators, students, friends, colleagues that deserve credit for this work. Thank you guys.